Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. And on behalf of University Housing, I welcome all of you to this evening's community conversation event titled Iraq and AFPAC, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan. And we'll have a, a brief assessment of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan this evening. Uh, the community conversation series is co-produced by two student groups in the residence halls, the Oregon Think Tank and the Oregon Brain Trust. And I'd also like to acknowledge our co-sponsors for the event that's made this series possible for, I believe, seven years now, uh, the Robert D. Clark Honors College, the Oregon Humanity Center, Undergraduate Studies, and the UO Libraries. And so we're very grateful to their financial support of the Community Conversation Series. Uh, we'll conclude at about 8.30 this evening, and we'll certainly reserve the last 30, maybe up to 40, 45 minutes for questions with the audience. So if you have questions, uh, please hold those until our final speaker um, concludes their opening remarks. And we also have comment cards available. If anybody would like to leave some feedback with us this evening, we'd be very appreciative of that. Uh, and you can find the comment cards, are they on the table by the food? Uh, and if there are any folks here from the Torture and Foreign Policy Seminar, we also have the sign-in sheet on the table in the back as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists this evening, and we're going to start on my far right. Uh, Dr. Alex Drackleby is a professor with the Department of History. Uh, Alex teaches upper and lower division courses on the Iraq War, uh, a sequence on war in the modern world, and special studies courses and seminars on the fall of France and the Great War. So Alex, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, next to Alex is Dr. Anita Weiss, a professor and chair of the Department of International Studies. Uh, professor Weiss specializes in gender, human human rights and social change in the Muslim world. She recently returned from a month-long trip to Pakistan. Uh, she's the author and editor of several books, including Interpreting Islam, Modernity, and Women's Rights. So again, thank you for joining us this evening. Weiss. 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 Uh, next to me on my left is Michael Smith. Uh, Michael Smith is a graduate student in the Conflict and Dispute Resolution Program at the University of Oregon, and he's currently uh, enrolled as a cadet in the Reserve Officer Training Corps as well, and he'll be commissioning as a second lieutenant in the infantry uh, this June. Uh, Mike served eight years in the Army Reserves as an operating room technician and eight years in the Oregon Army National Guard as an infantryman. Uh, he was deployed during Desert Storm and Desert Shield and Operation Iraqi Freedom II. And finally, on my far left is Sean Knack. He is an undergraduate student in international studies. Uh, he's also a veteran of Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, Sean served in the Army Infantry and the 3rd Brigade, uh, I'm sorry, 3rd Brigade, 10th Mountain Division. So please uh, join me in welcoming our panelists. Picture of Iraq. I'm going to sit there while you talk. <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, so those of you who aren't, don't know much about Iraq, there's the Persian Gulf. There's Kuwait, its neighbors, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Turkey, and Iran. It's got a lot of neighbors. Uh, I just want to say three things by way of introduction, and then any questions we might have. Um, the first two come up from teaching a class in the Iraq War, which I've been doing the last three or four years. Um, and I, I got interested in that class, mostly because I thought it would be interesting to teach the history of an event that hadn't ended. I wasn't sure what that would mean. Um, <clears throat> and that course is where I come by most of my knowledge of Iraq. I'm not a Middle East expert. Uh, I'm not an expert on Iraq. There aren't too many of them, in fact, in the US, um, at least academic ones. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's where I'm, where I'm coming from here. Three little points I want to make. Um, these two come out of my class. It's things that I learned that, that my students often aren't fully aware of. The first one is, of course, the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003, but it never really fully managed either to secure the country or to establish a functional civilian government or affect an economic recovery. Between 2003 and 2006, the situation um, worsened dramatically to the point where the country was falling apart and was in a situation of civil war. Um, the most obvious expression of this was intersectarian conflict between Sunni and Shia populations, uh, to a great extent the work of militias, but complicated by the fact that the interior ministry of the Iraqi government seems to have been taken over by a Shia militia. And this is the first point that I would just emphasize, is just how how bad the situation was at the peak of the Civil War. 
Uh, toward the end of 2006 and into 2007, um, you had nearly 4,000 Iraqi civilian deaths per month. So it peaks around 3,800. If you want to put that in American terms, if you want to control for population, that would be roughly akin to about 300,000 American civilians dying in a year. So this is a big, big number. Another index of just how bad the situation had gotten in Iraq in 2006 and 2007 is indicated by the number of Iraqis who were fleeing where they lived. By 2007, about 2.8 million Iraqis, <clears throat> roughly 10% of the population, a bit more than 10%, were internally displaced. That is, they'd moved somewhere else um, within Iraq itself. In the same year, around 2 million Iraqis had actually left the country, physically left the country, another a little bit less than 10%. All told, in 2006, 2007, um, roughly speaking, we don't have exact figures. These are estimates. Um, somewhere around 20% of the entire population of Iraq was either internally displaced or abroad. Most of those people abroad went either to Jordan or especially to Syria. So that's my first point, is just to emphasize just how bad it was at that point. This is my second point. <clears throat> I think that's often uh, not realized, especially since Iraq has really fallen off the map of US news the last couple of years, really for the last year and a half, is just how dramatically the situation has improved since the worst period. Although, as of last January, that's the last month for which we seem to have numbers, not this last January, the uh, January before, um, the numbers of displaced persons hadn't significantly changed. As far as anyone can tell, about 30,000 people a month are returning um, to where they originally lived. Um, but all the same, the security situation has really improved dramatically. And I, this is really why I brought this. I only want to show two graphs. This is illustrated in these two. Um, the single best place to get um, broad-based data on Iraq is, a, is something that's put together um, by Michael O'Hanlon at the Brookings Institute. It's called the Iraqi Index. He's been doing this on a monthly basis. It's not him, obviously. It's a team of people. Um, it's under his name, though. And he's been doing these um, monthly for the past seven years. So it's a relatively easy, systematic way of charting how things change over the course of the conflict. <coughs> Here's May of 2000, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009. So this is the estimated number of Iraqi civilian fatalities by month, May 2003 to the present. So this is what I was talking about, this massive increase of civilian deaths in the first half of 2006, peaks in the latter half of 2006, starts to decline. And here you see a, a very substantial decline and a, something of an evening out. There's been a recent uptick of violence the last couple of months. Most people are reading it as a lead in to um, the elections. Um, but in fact, it's still pretty low compared to where we were a few years ago. Another example of this um, so, this is the Iraqi civilian deaths. And I, I might mention just in passing that. Um, some of these civilians were killed in bombings. Um, many of them were, in fact, abducted, tortured, and then left for dead um, in the street or in a canal or whatever. There was um, very purposeful violence against individuals in which people would show the marks of the violence in their bodies uh, for people to find the next day. There an extraordinary amount of, of um, torture uh, taking place in 2006, 2007, and some of it extraordinarily gory. This shows roughly the same kind of process. It's a different metric, though. It's enemy-initiated attacks against the coalition and its partners by week. So here you can see there's October 2006, 2007. So this is the period, uh, let's see, this is the period that corresponds with the surge here uh, when President Bush made a decision to um, introduce more troops into Iraq and alter the strategy in Iraq. You saw an increase in violence and then a relatively steady decline to this point here. And we recently had a month where the US had no fatalities in Iraq. It was the first time, I believe, since the invasion 
Um, and I believe this last month we had one, but it was, I believe it was a traffic accident. Um, I'm not sh absolutely sure of that, but I think so. All right, so those are my first two points. One, a rise in, in violence and a decline in violence. Situation has improved and improved quite dramatically, even as serious problems remain. And I can talk about those if anyone wants. This is my third point. This will be my last point. As it so happens, uh, this wasn't planned, but Iraq will be holding national elections on Sunday. Um, these elections will elect members of a new parliament. And that parliament will determine the next president of Iraq. And the president will then um, select someone to form a new government. That is, someone to be prime minister. And of course, he'll have to select, it will be a he, and he'll have to select uh, someone who's capable of putting together a government that is a sustainable majority in the parliament. Uh, this will be the second such elections since the fall of Saddam Hussein. The first took place a little over four years ago. It was those elections in December of 2005 that led to um, the current prime minister becoming prime minister, Nuri al-Maliki, fairly complicated process. Um, and they come after the national provincial elections that took place a little over a year ago, last January 2009, which were the first such national elections in three years. Uh, nobody knows exactly what's going to happen. Polling data is very sparse for Iraq. Uh, and the political situation is very fragmented. Uh, we can make some guesses. Whatever happens, what's quite clear is the new government inherits a lot of political problems and issues. Um, a lot of the biggest problems, political pro issues that, um, that Iraqis face have, in a sense, been punted down the road to the post-election period. And it's very difficult to know what's going to happen after that. So that's all I've got to say for, um, for introductory remarks. And I think I can turn this off. But, whoops, I go on like that. OK, um, my name is Mike. And um, sorry, I don't have any cool PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> that's where it goes. Um, what I am going to speak about is just some of the experiences that I had just from an overall standpoint and possibly some specific things. Um, one thing that I'm not going to go into, mainly because during this time, as a soldier, we are, um, we are not political in regards to what is happening back here at home. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions about you know, my ideas about the war and everything like that. But you need to understand that as a soldier, we are not political. Now, we might have political parties that we, that we join, or um, you know, we definitely vote and all that type of stuff. But as soldiers on the battlefield or soldiers here at home, um, we are not political. So I want to put that out to begin with. Um, my experience in Iraq were basically twofold. I was deployed in 2003 to, to 2004, um, came back home, and then I was deployed again from 2004 to 2005. Both deployments were drastically different in that my, um, my first deployment Basically, nothing happened. Um, I was pretty much in rural Iraq, 30 miles south of Baghdad. A lot of sheep, a lot of cows, a lot of canals, a lot of just traveling up and down the highway. Nothing too exciting. Um, but what I didn't realize is how much of an idiot we were actually were. Um, in regards to that, we traveled with, and you, Sean will understand this, we hardly traveled with any type of security, especially when we went deep into the rural parts of Iraq. Um, there were times where we would just go out in one truck and the whole squad would be in the back of a Humvee. Um, there was a lot of things that we did during that company that I look back at um, that showed that we were, we were not very smart. Secondly, what was really interesting about my first deployment was that there's a main highway called MSR Tampa, or Main Supply Route Tampa. And on one side, the farmers and the individuals that lived in that area, they really liked us. We can go into the areas, we can talk with them, we can get information, um, and we can be all buddy-buddy. Right across the highway, the farmers over on that side did not like us. And even though we can go in there, we can go into their areas, they would not talk to us. And we do believe that there was a little bit that went on with, um, we worked with some MPs, uh, military police, and they weren't very nice to anyone. So when we would go into an area as an infantry soldier, and our mission really was to try to build some community with the, with the individuals in the rural areas, 
they wasn't having it sometimes. So that was made it difficult to do our mission, which is at, at that time to try to protect the individuals from the insurgents that were attacking them. Um, that deployment went for about four months. Um, then we ended up coming back to Kuwait. I came back home, things were cool. Um, and I had this, I had this sense of invincibility because nothing happened to us. We would travel up and on the highways. Um, very rarely would we get shot at. Um, and I had this, over sense, this sense of overconfidence, this sense of nothing can harm me. Um, I, and I felt really good about myself. When I decided to go back, it was a different story because when I was going back, I was replacing individuals that had either been wounded or killed. Um, my guard unit lost uh, 50 individuals due to wounded in action, and we lost 10 to killed in action. And me and the group that was heading back over there was replacing these individuals. And there was a couple of times I had panic attacks because at this point, I was going back or I was replacing individuals that actually um, was harmed or killed. And that, that kind of messed with my mind a little bit. And it, it really caused me to question. During the first deployment, I had no question. We're going to go. We're going to do what we need to do. We're going to, we're going to go back. And also on the flip side, it was like a field trip. Hey, I'm going to Iraq. I get to go see cool things, which I did. I, get, I got to see where Nebuchadnezzar sat. Um, I went to the, where the Tower of Babel was. I, I was all over the place. But it was like a field trip. Um, and it'd be like going and playing paintball. And then, oh, by the way, we're going to go see some historical sites. Uh, the second deployment was drastically different. Uh, because not only was I going to replace individuals, I was also going, and we was going to be deployed. We was going to be patrolling in Baghdad, and that this is during the, the times that uh, the violence was increasing. I mean, it was spiking. Um, there were roadside bombs. Um, you know, we'd get shot. The first time I got shot at, I laughed, um, not because I thought it was funny, because it was like, holy shit, they're shooting at us. Um, the first time I got shot at, it was in the, if you can imagine, walking down Franklin. That's what we do. We walk down the middle of the road. And um, I got shot at. There's no place to take cover. No trees, no buildings, no nothing. And all I could do was get on the ground. And then my sergeant, being the infantry sergeant he is, <coughs> tells us to get up because we're going to go look for him. Um, that's a bit disconcerting because it's at night. And they're in buildings, and we're not. Um, so the second time I went back, it wasn't about field trips. It wasn't about, cool, I get to go run around in Baghdad or anything like that. It was, what are you doing? Um, and it really caused me to question, um, what were we doing in Iraq? Um, I don't question my commanders. I didn't quest question my NCOs. Um, I don't even question the Army at times. But at this point, I really had to take a, I had to take a inventory of myself and what do I believe? What do I think? Um, and when I went back the second time, it wasn't about, it wasn't about the Iraqi people. Um, it wasn't about protecting the Iraqi people. It was about, um, it was about being with my unit. And it was about being with the, with my soldiers. It was about being with the individuals that we, that I trained with. And there's, you can't explain that. Um, it's like uh, who played on sports, okay? Anybody on sports teams? Okay. It's basically training for six, seven months for that first game. And that's all you do is you train and you train and you train and you get so excited and you build that bond. Um, and that's what it was, except in, in this case it was a little bit more, um, well, the consequences are a little bit more, um, dangerous. And uh, so the second deployment, it was scarier. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, but there were some funny moments, too. Um, this, and you have a different sense of humor over there. Things that, and Sean could attest to this, too. <laughs> things that are funny over there are not funny here. An example. I was doing hard site security at these three hotels. And I finished my shift, so it was time to sleep. So I'm sleeping, and all of a sudden, the building starts doing this. So I'm like, who the hell is shaking the building? <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious. That's what I thought. Who the hell is shaking the building? Come to find out, an IED went off 
roughly a thousand meters down the road. Blew a car seven, eight stories into another building. That's what I say, meaning who's shaking the building and oh, oh, that's real cute, real funny, but no more than a thousand meters away, an IED went off. So those are the experiences we have. And see, and I tell you this not to sensationalize war, and I'm not in the army because I'm a warmonger or I'm not commissioning because of anything like that. Um, I'm in the army, this is going to sound cheesy, it's because I believe that we do have the best country in the world, and this country has given me a lot. Um, and this is my way of giving back. Um, I don't expect anybody else to do this, um, and, and never will. Um, and what I hope is that individuals, even though individuals might disagree with the war, whether it's in Iraq, in Afghanistan, whatever, um, don't, don't disagree with the soldiers, um, because I know that, and there's differing opinions about the army. You know, we shouldn't have an army or whatever. Um, sometimes that's the only option some people have to, to make it in this world. So that's my spiel. I guess there's going to be a Q and A, and I'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have. So, but that's what I got. Hi, I'm Sean. Um, I served with the army for three and a half years. I did uh, a year, almost a year and a half, in Afghanistan. And I would disagree with Mike. Uh, I think that stuff that happened over there is still funny. Um, I remember, and I mean, you know, I don't mean to turn this into war story time with Sean, but uh, the first time I ever got shot at, I laughed. And I mean, it's, it's just a reflex. There's what else are you going to do? Um, I was sitting in a truck, and we're getting shot at. You know, we're taking small arms, we're taking RPGs, stuff's blowing up everywhere. I go to step out of my truck, and I open the door, and I look down, and somebody shoots right where I'm about to put my foot. I'm like, I'm going to stay in my truck for a minute. <laughs> I'm just going to hang out. And I'll, I'll step out again in a second, which I did. I had another friend in that same contact. He just rolled his window down and shot through the window. <laughs> Whatever works for you. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just give you a brief uh, overview of my experience. Um, and then I'd like to give a little uh, perspective on what it is we're doing in Afghanistan right now. You know, there's a lot of terms being thrown around out there. Counterinsurgency, surge. Uh, <laughs> A hundred different things, and I want to help you guys have a little bit better understanding of what men and women your age are doing over there right now. Uh, I was in a very hot part of Afghanistan. Not hot as in temperature, although that too. Uh, we were the second highest amount of contact uh, in Afghanistan in 2006, 2007. Uh, we were in about a firefight a week. Uh, I didn't have the, um, the go look at cool stuff experience. I kind of wish I did. Uh, we lived in tents. We built a fob uh, when I wasn't... What's a fob? Oh, a fob, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Ford Operating Base. Ford Operating Base is an area of about, oh, I don't know, about the size of this quad, right? The Living Learning Center, that whole area, uh, where you live and you work. Um, we built that fob. Uh, when I wasn't on patrol, I was digging ditches, I was filling sandbags, I was doing a hundred other things. Um, we arrived in Afghanistan, it was, uh, we were right on the border with, with Pakistan, and our job was to interdict movement of men and material uh, through an area called the Dashta. It's a big open, not, uh, when I say big open area, you gotta put it in the context of Afghanistan. It's an area of about uh, eight square kilometers, which is pretty large, but when you are thinking of it in the context of a whole country that does this the whole way through, it's, it's fairly small. So anywho, our job was to keep an eye on that area and make sure nobody got through there it wasn't supposed to. Uh, we did a lot of patrols, did a lot of engaging with uh, locals, uh, did a lot of uh, what they call med caps, where you go out to a village and you uh, treat a sick kid, you hand out medicine, you do all that stuff. So I, I hope that um, nobody in here has the impression of an infantryman, I was an infantryman, uh, as a person who just wants to go out there and cut throats and shoot babies. I've been called a baby killer. Uh, all that stuff has come up. It's not that way. There's a lot, of, a lot of different things that happen, a lot of different responsibilities you have. Anyway, a lot of different types of contact. Um, we, by the time we were through uh, with uh, Operation During Freedom 7, uh, as I said, about a uh, firefight a week, um, and that was about the time the surge was going on in Afghanistan, or excuse me, in Iraq. And uh, so we were getting ready to go home, and we left Afghanistan. We were in Kuwait. We were 12 hours from getting on a bird and going home. And my lieutenant comes in the tent and he says, pick up your shit. 
You're getting turned around, you're going back for six months to a year. It's like, all right. <laughs> Sounds like a party. We'd been ridiculously lucky. Uh, we'd been in a lot of contact. We'd lost one uh, attached member of our unit. Um, he, he had died. Other than that, we had a lot of wounded, but we didn't, we didn't have any KIA. And as soon as we were told we were, turning, we were going back, we knew. We knew we were losing people. Because uh, it had just, it gotten worse and worse as time had gone on. So we went back, we relieved the unit that was there, which, you know, is, is maybe, I'm, I'm not a person who believes in God, but, you know, maybe because the people that we left in, in charge of that fob were god-awful. They didn't know how to do their job, and we probably saved a lot of lives by going back there. Um, uh, so we were back in Afghanistan. We got, we got hurt. Uh, we had a lot more wounded, a lot more. Uh, we did lose two guys, KIA. Uh, I got blown up. Uh, I was a gunner in a Humvee. You know, the Humvee's got a hole in the top where you get a big, heavy gun, right? So I'm standing in, uh, in that hole, and we're rolling down a little valley. And uh, all of a sudden, our 10-ton truck is about as high in the air as the ceiling. It was a big, big bottom boom. Um, truck comes down. It's in two different pieces. Uh, everyone survives. So we can laugh about it, and that's, that's the rule. Uh, as long as everyone survives and everyone keeps their limbs, it's funny. Whatever it is, it's funny. Uh, so just to give you kind of a, a ground level view of, of what that's like, you know, IED goes off, truck goes up in the air, uh, comes back down, everything is on fire. I got people screaming in the Humvee that they're on fire and they weren't, just their pants were, which I mean, you know, if my pants were on fire, I would be concerned myself. But uh, So I crawl out the, the roof of the Humvee, get the fire extinguisher, put the fire out, and I go around. And uh, my driver, right, you got the steering column of a vehicle, you know what I'm talking about? The steering column has come down and crushed his leg in four places. His knee is facing to the left, his shin bone is over to the right, his foot is facing kind of in the middle. And he's like, dude, I think I broke my leg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he broke your leg. Um, so uh, got him out of the truck, uh, we evac'd out, we received a little bit of small arms fire on the way out, and uh, that, was, that was a tough experience. That was, you know, in a firefight, uh, somebody shoots at you, you get to shoot back at them, and that's a good feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as nobody gets hurt uh, on your side, that's a good feeling. Um, IED, coward's weapon. Hate that thing, because it just comes out of nowhere and it's not fair. Can't see it coming. Uh, at least, you know, Americans, you know when they're there. Anyway, um, so we were there for about another month after that, took a few more wounded, and had a rough time. Um, we have a Q&A session after all this that has been mentioned. Um, I am perfectly open and willing to answer any question you have about absolutely anything, no matter how personal or invasive it may seem, because I think it is absolutely vital that people who have the experiences that I have share them with people who do not. I think that there are too many uh, veterans who come back and they don't want to either associate with people who haven't been in the military or don't want to talk about their experiences because they're too fain painful, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think the right thing to do is come back and you know, let people know what I've done, let people know what people like Mike have done so that everyone who's an American knows that they share a responsibility with people like us. Uh, that you at any time could go and choose to serve your country, and I know I'm not here to recruit anybody, uh, but everyday people like you are out there doing that job, and they're getting hurt. And I think it's important to recognize. Now, I'm going to use that chalkboard, if that's OK. <laughs> What's going on in Afghanistan right now uh, is new strategy, <coughs> wherein we are basically surging a whole bunch of troops. And uh, Professor Weiss and I have talked about this in the past, and she doesn't really like it. I think it's a grand idea, and I'll explain <laughs> why in a moment. Um, if I say anything wrong, you can wrap me on my knuckles. It's not in my class this time. So <laughs> That's fair. I'm not getting someone. graded. Uh, so what's happening is we're throwing a whole mess of troops at Afghanistan. Why are we doing that? The insurgency is like a fire, right? Picture a, a fire in a fire pit. What does fire need? It needs spark, fuel, oxygen. Spark, we invaded Afghanistan. OK, fair enough. Uh, fuel and oxygen. Let's say that fuel is men. Let's say that oxygen is material. What you were doing when you surge people into an area the way we're doing right now is you were taking a wet blanket and you were throwing it on that fire. 
you're depriving it of oxygen and fuel, because you're cooling down the fuel. Don't look too hard into the fire thing. <laughs> anyway, the way we are doing that is through a method called ink spotting. And the way ink spotting works, uh, if you can't tell, this is not Afghanistan. Um, <laughs> the way ink spotting works is you take control of major to minor population centers, right? This is Oregon. If I was running a counterinsurgency search campaign in Oregon, what I would want to do is I would want to control Portland, Eugene, Medford, for sure. Now, how many of y'all are familiar with geography in Oregon? Fair amount, I imagine? OK, fair enough. There's a little town south of here called Cottage Grove. I would want to control Cottage Grove, because that is a small to medium size area, right? So I, I can control Cottage Grove. Uh, who knows Vita? You know Vida? Vida is a little tiny town out to the west of here if you go down, ni not 99, whatever that, one, thank you, 126. I would not want to control Vida because Vida has like 300 people in it. What do I care about Vida? Uh, the way an insurgency works is if you're an insurgent, you want to get to that population center and you want to turn that population center over to your way of thinking. You want them to work against the government. You want them to think that the government can do nothing for them. You want them to think that the government is evil, bad, corrupt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the people in Vida can think that. I don't care, there's 300 of them, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the people in Cottage Grove, I want them to know better. People in Eugene, I want them to know better. People in Portland, I want to know better. Because once they come around to that way of thinking, uh, and you can argue whether, you know, Western way of thinking is good, better, best, or, I don't know, all that political stuff like Mike was talking about. Bottom line is, if you want to, you want to control an area and keep an insurgent from controlling it, you have to control not the thoughts of the people, because that sounds Orwellian, but you want to control <laughs> opinion. You want to influence opinion. You want to bring those people over to your side. The way you do that is by helping them out. You don't want to have those people thinking that you're evil, bad, etc. You build schools, you build hospitals, you do med caps, you do all kinds of stuff. So really, the number one way to battle an insurgency is by dealing with poverty and dealing with uh, whatever social problems government-wise exist. Because if you take away their basis, if you take away their anger, Insurgency's over. Done and done. Uh, all that said, I think Professor Weiss is probably going to talk more about the social end of that, so I will hand no, it over. No, I'm going to respond exactly as you just. Oh, cool. <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, I'm Anita Weiss, professor of international studies, and I'm sorry if this has been distracting, but after he had the map of Iraq up in, the, um, up in the projector, I thought, hey, why not show you a map of Pakistan and Afghanistan? So while you were talking about Afghanistan, I was still trying to get it up there. And despite having five of these Mac connections, we somehow just really can't figure out how to get it up there. So if you, if you really don't know uh, the geopolitical um, layout of where Pakistan and Afghanistan are, I, I'd like to urge you to come and take a little, you know, try to take a little look at what, what is uh, on, my, on my map right now. Just a couple of things by way of introduction that I'd like to say. That, which ones should I start with? <laughs> what has happened in Afghanistan, we have to understand what Afghanistan itself has endured for the last 30 years. Now we have to understand, actually even going back further in history, about how at the turn of the last century, um, Russia and Britain were using Iran and Afghanistan as part of this staging ground for what they called the Great Game. The Great Game is still going on, but, but, for, but for whose benefit and for whose detriment? In the last 30 years ago, the former Soviet Union, December of 1979, invaded Afghanistan. It had had very close relationships with Afghanistan going back to the 1920s. You have to remember that a couple of generations of Afghans had actually gone to Russia, had gone to Moscow for, for higher education and study. So that's who Afghanistan had had closer links with. But in December of 1979, former Soviet Union invaded. And in fact, the United States at that time had deemed that it was to the US foreign policy interests to try to overstretch the former Soviet Union in Afghanistan 
Many of you have probably now seen the major motion picture, Charlie Wilson's War. Um, I knew Charlie Wilson. Unfortunately, Charlie, Charlie Wilson actually died, I think it was less than a month ago. Um, Charlie Wilson was as flamboyant a character as Tom Hanks portrays him as being, actually more flamboyant. When I met him, I remember feeling that Charlie Wilson looked like he was eight foot seven or something. I mean, it was humongous. Texan, okay? But the thing, the important thing about Charlie Wilson was that he hated the Russians. He hated communism, he hated the Soviet Union. And so because he was um, head of the House Appropriations Committee at the time, he was able to appropriate humongous amounts of funds that went to, that, that went to fighting against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. But what actually happened in these past 31 years, you know, since the Soviet Union had invaded? What happens it? What happened was over three million. Afghanistan is not a country with a very large population. You have to understand, very mountainous, not ever very developed. Over three million Afghans had fled to Pakistan. Over two million Afghans had fled to Iran. So. You have a couple of generations now of Afghans who are not tied to their soil, who never really grew up there, who don't know how to farm the crops that Afghans normally would farm, right? But what they have, re what, what has remained important to them are many Afghan sociocultural and political traditions when they've gone to refugee camps in Pakistan or Iran, when they have tried to infiltrate Pakistani society and become a part of it, they've issues of pakhtunkhwa, issues of revenge, and, and I guess the point that I'm trying to make is no matter where Afghans go, they will never forget what happened to Afghanistan. And this is something that, I, that they will embrace for many generations to come. So that's one thing you need to understand about the area. Another thing you need to understand about the area is, exactly, is the tie between, this is Afghanistan here, and this is Pakistan over here. Too often, when we use this terminology of AFPAC, I mean, I think if people think it was roughly coined about a year ago. It's probably Holbrook who coined the term. And that is the idea that in American foreign policy uh, optics, that Afghanistan and Pakistan are joined at the hip. That when we start to talk about this region, we're talking about these two countries very deeply interconnectedly. You have to recognize that Pakistan is the sixth largest country in the world population-wise. Pakistan has had a very developed economic infrastructure, a political infrastructure which periodically falls apart and then gets rejuvenated. But I mean, it's quite a developed political infrastructure, local bodies, Supreme Court issues. You've probably heard about the lawyers' movement to reinstate the chief justice of Pakistan. This is a very, very different country than Afghanistan is. Pakistanis mind it when Americans think of Afghanistan and Pakistan in the same light, because we're really talking about countries that are very, very um, economically, politically, historically, and all quite different. However, what has happened in Afghanistan, especially since October of 2001, has had, has had such an enormous impact on Pakistan that things now in Pakistan have never been worse politically. So part of the issues are that the United States invaded Afghanistan in October of 2001. At that time, it was ostensibly to hunt out Osama bin Laden. I did not believe it then, and I still do not believe it now, that that is the reason the United States invaded Afghanistan. I have a lot to do with different people in the US government, and I truly believe that if we were really looking for Osama bin Laden, if we really wanted a quick end to this all, we would have found him. Or we would have found many of his high up deputies who are ostensibly in Pakistan. But that's not really what the United States was doing. The United States sent troops there. 
I regret every death of an American. I regret every death of an Afghan. That was a result of the U.S. sending troops to Afghanistan in the wake of the disaster of September 11, 2001. Don't forget that not one of, of the people who were on the planes who attacked the United States, there was not one Afghan who was part of that attack, okay? Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I'm not going to go into the whole long history of Afghanistan and, who, and, and, and what happened. But suffice it to say, one of the poorest countries in the world, at the time when the United States was trying to build up support for fighting against the former Soviet Union, the United States had put out this call to Muslims worldwide to come and fight the former Soviet Union. The people who came set up bases. They basically set up like hotels, right? And this is what became Al-Qaeda. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not defending Al-Qaeda. I'm saying, what is the origin of this? And what's the connection with Afghanistan? The Afghans saw these people as coming to their help at their, at their worst time in history. And so, and so when these people later, when Al-Qaeda was thrown, up, thrown out of Sudan, thrown out of Tunisia, wherever, Afghanistan has nothing. So here Al-Qaeda came and said, OK, well, we can help you pay some of our, your bills. Just give us a place where we can be. <laughs> the United States knows where Al-Qaeda you know, had, was set up prior to 2001, you know. I mean, the United States has very verifiable intelligence as to, you know, where Al-Qaeda had training camps and what have you. The final point I wanted to make, though, now, is how much Americans have not been told about what's really been happening in Afghanistan. And I don't mean only since October of 2001. For example, you might remember that it was very big news that there were these caves that were found. And they were trying to make it seem like they were laughing at Osama bin Laden. Oh, look at how Al-Qaeda has taken refuge in these caves at Tora Bora and you know this elaborate system of caves that they have Al-Qaeda and, um, and the Taliban in Afghanistan on the run. The United, what they never told you is the U.S. government built those caves when we were fighting against the former Soviet Union. And I know that as a firsthand fact. So it's like we have, things have not been represented clearly in the U.S. about what's been happening in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. In addition to that, the final point I, want, I wanted to raise is what, what are our goals in Afghanistan, what are our military goals? This is what Sean and I have talked about a lot. If I was convinced that I, that you know we had clearly articulated goals, then I you know I could at least get behind that. When Holbrook was asked in September, it was either September or October, what would success mean for the U.S. military mission in Afghanistan? He said, "I don't know, but I'm sure we'll recognize it when we find it." And I'm sorry, that is no good reason for sacrificing, for risking any American lives or for risking any Afghan lives. I see no, yeah, um, I don't make a distinction between Americans and Afghans being killed because I think any time, I mean, I think that's irresponsible. I think the U.S. military engagement in, in Afghanistan is irresponsible. I think that there's other reasons behind why the Bush administration had wanted to build up um, you know, our military involvement there. It may, it's good news for American businesses. I think it's very disastrous that Obama has not tried to withdraw more um, from Afghanistan, that he did opt to build up the surge, but with defined dates for the withdrawal. Um, and we also have to re recognize, though, that in hunting for Taliban and Al-Qaeda from Afghanistan that have gone into Pakistan, we are destabilizing Pakistan in unprecedented ways, especially in what has been going on in the federally administered tribal areas of, of Pakistan with the drone attacks that are going on there. Every time there is a drone attack, there, it's, they say that you know, drone attacks have killed more civilians than, than people involved in any type of you know, martial, military, militaristic encounter. Every time we attack in 
those areas with the drones, we're, we're getting more and more people dedicated to hating America for many generations to come. And I just don't see what a useful outcome that is either. So I've kind of gone on for a couple of different points, but um, I guess that's a good way to, a good place to start. Well, I'm going to pass the mic around just for the uh, benefit of the your <coughs> question. So if folks want to raise their hand, I'll bring you the mic. <coughs> Uh, so this is a question for Dr. Uh, Weiss. Is that Weiss? Is that how pronounce it? Um, so you say you were talking about how we're you don't believe that we went into Afghanistan for uh, because for to retaliate or for revenge for the September 11th attack. No, I said to find Osama bin Laden. So so okay, so we didn't go to find Osama bin Laden. So what is it that uh, I that, that, do you have a theory as to why we really went in? what the actual reason was? No, I, I, I see, what you were doing was taking what I said a little out of context. We def the United States government definitely attacked Afghanistan in October of 2001 for revenge. I was in Pakistan on September 11th. Um, pretty clear sense of even Pakistanis agreed with the idea of the US attack on Afghanistan, as a, because this is where these people had trained. So you would, very quickly, within, with, in less than a month, the Afghan Taliban government fell. And then why are we there? After the fall of the Taliban government, you install your own government. You, installed, you install a government that is friendly towards the United States that could not even win a rigged election. That's how corrupt that government has been. We have, we have hardly done anything to engage in helping to build a civil society in, in Afghanistan, to help to build up industry, to help to repair roads, to help to put Afghans back on a path where they can actually run and govern their own society. What I was saying is that it's, that it's I mean, we all know that the checkered history, we were in Afghanistan and then we got diverted over to Iraq and then later on we came back to Afghanistan. But still, there's been fighting that's been going on in Afghanistan all along. And what I'm saying is that if the goal was to get rid of the government that had given safe refuge and a place to Al Qaeda to train, well, that happened within a month. What has been our goal ever since the fall of the Taliban in Afghanistan? And the more that you, the more that you make weapons, there's, there, that's a factor that goes into the economy. The more that Halliburton is there, and they're putting up. Um, Halliburton provides clothes for the military. They feed the military. There's a whole economic thing that's going on that has nothing to do with Afghanistan. That's the point that I'm trying to make. So, so you're saying that it's the, the ulterior motive as to why we're there is, is, is kind of this military-industrial complex idea? There's a, or? Actually, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ideas for ulterior motives. I mean, some people have said whether it's a gas pipeline or what have you. The reality is that what we have been sold as to why we're there, I don't think is, is I, I don't think is viable, and I think Holbrook himself even agrees with it. We're not there to to find Osama bin Laden. We're not there to find the top echelon of the leadership of Al Qaeda, and in part because everybody knows that they're not in Afghanistan. I, I would just throw out a quick counterpoint to some of the stuff that uh, Anita said. She and I agree completely that uh, we definitely, the, the, loss, the, the last six, seven years of uh, the war in Afghanistan have been kind of, I'm not going to say a bust, but I would definitely call it a draw uh, or something that has not worked out as well for the Afghan people. But I think that we're in a situation now, we have leadership now that gives us the opportunity to do better. And I, when I initially left Afghanistan, I did not support the war. I, I got out of the military because I was very upset with the way we prosecuted it, <laughs> and I'm planning to go back now because I feel like we're at least getting ready to do a better job. But I'll just add to that, what, what, um, what I recommend for U.S. In involvement in Afghanistan is not to necessarily send more soldiers, but to send people who can help Afghans learn, relearn. I mean, it's really people to learn for, first to farm the land. We need to send people to help to build roads that have been 
that never were very good in the first place, but have been totally devastated after 30 years of war. We also need to send security forces to ensure that when you start to send trucks with goods on those roads, that they can have safe passage. But what you don't need to do is the more standard traditional military involvement, because who is the enemy? That's the question there. Who is the enemy? Uh, so, hi. Um, um, this, anyone can, on the panel can answer this. Uh, how do you feel about like uh, the new change of uh, command in Afghanistan, uh, General Stanley McChrystal, and sort of his uh, policy of reducing airstrikes and uh, doing less like active counterinsurgency and more sort of like helping out the smaller communities? Do you think that's more of a step in the right direction as uh, as far as like U.S. military policy? Um, I would say that if that started before Stanley McChrystal. <coughs> Uh, at the end of the Bush administration, which some of the military decisions that were made in the Bush administration were, it's hard to believe that professional military officers made those. Mm -hmm. But uh, towards the end of the administration, we had a group of people that started to rise to the top, General David Petraeus, a uh, gentleman by the name of David Kilcullen, who wrote a great book called The Accidental Guerrilla, which I highly recommend, um, who started to see that engaging those small communities, that's a part of counterinsurgency, because you're trying to win those people back over to your side. So we're still engaging in counterinsurgency, but we're engaging in a better, more efficient, more targeted counterinsurgency that will hopefully uh, carry us through down the road. We're applying a whole bunch of lessons that we learned not only in Vietnam, but in the last few years of this war on what does not, what does and what does not work. Well, because I just wanted to say that you can't win hearts and minds if you're bombing them from 5,000 feet up in the air, okay? Um, and secondly, to um, something that Sean said is that a lot of, I'm, I'm in the infantry, Sean's in the infantry, and even before I was in the infantry, um, you know, I always thought that infantry soldier was just a, a dumb grunt that couldn't do anything else in the army. And what you're finding is that they're the soldiers that are down making contact with these smaller communities. Um, and I'm, my experiences are more in Iraq, but I think I can make a correlation here is that when we're down on the ground and we are actually engaging with the community, okay, it does come back to us. It does have a positive effect to us because we're going into their community and we're really trying to make a difference in it, along with um, one thing that, um, that Dr. Weiss brought up is that, you know, building up a surge of soldiers, which is understandable, but not all those soldiers are going to be combat soldiers, okay? That we have the smallest infantry in the world. Okay, so when that surge comes, we are going to have other soldiers that are on the ground with the infantry soldier. You're going to have combat engineers that build roads, that build um, housing. You're going to have medical. You're going to have lawyers. You're going to have all these other troops that are on the ground also, along with the infantry soldier, to try to bring stability to that area. So what I would say is that I believe that they're moving in the right direction. I also like the fact that Obama did make an attempt to have a pullout time. Okay, so with the pullout time, you do need to have a surge. This is what happened in Iraq, the same thing. They made a loose time that everybody's going to be out. You surge the troops in there because you still have to start getting troops out. So you need to bring in more troops so they can help with that stabilization of the area. And I see with what's happening in Afghanistan, it's the same thing. They build the surge up so you can start cycling troops out, but then also start reducing the number of troops that are within the area. A great example, just very quickly, of uh, what Mike was saying. We had a school that we built in a community that did not care for Americans. Uh, built up their school. Uh, Taliban came along, blew it up. Okay, no problem. Went in, we built it right back up, big brick by brick. Came in, they blew it up again. No problem. Rebuilt it. By the time we were done, though that town had come to our side, and they said, we believe that you are here to help us. Well, and, that, that's and that's the point important. that I'm making, what, yeah. what Sean's saying. I mean... You win many more hearts and minds by doing things to show a community mm -hmm. that you're actually caring about their long-term future. But if you go into a community, you know, with um, just with arms and the like, which is something that had been common until very recently, it's only really the last year that U.S. troops have been engaged in more building of roads and the like. I mean, it, it just went on for eight years without hardly anything being done. Not a single aspect of rebuilding Afghanistan was even attempted until a year ago. Um, for the first time, 
right now, the U.S. plan is emphasizing agriculture, job creation, and what what Obama is calling justice, meaning putting in um, civil society institutions, putting in a legal system and the like. This had never been done before. And again, it had never been done before while the US government was supporting an incredibly corrupt state. Um, we had not spent much time identifying viable Afghan partners on the ground. And so, you know, if, if these are known drug lords, um, who are benefiting from, from U.S. engagement, how do you think other people are looking at who our allies are? The other, the other part of, the, of, of this piece about helping to build civil society, helping to build uh, political institutions, is just to remember how, you know, with what John was saying about the Taliban destroying things, there's also now the new the threat on the other side of the border, the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan, calls itself the Taliban, a completely different organization. But they've been doing essentially the same thing. And so again, with the Kerry Luger bill of, you know, seven point five billion dollars over the next five years to Pakistan, the goal is pretty much the same thing in terms of helping to build, you know, political institutions um, infrastructure, health care, education, what have you. But the problem is, every time there's a drone attack that kills civilians, whether in Fat, mostly in Fata is where the drone attacks have been, but every, but every time, you know, civilians get killed, all those millions, if not billions of dollars are going to waste because so suddenly, then people get the sense of, of revenge and a vendetta. That answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have another question, you don't mind. Uh, how have some of like the regional powers, such as like China, India, Iran, been reacting to the United States' presence in the Middle East? Because I mean, it, it it would seem almost like stupid that they would just be completely ignoring our actions and not doing anything to like to react to it. Like, what have what have they been doing? Yeah, it's a that's a very long answer. So. Um, so that I don't give a long answer, I'll just say you have to look at China's own geostrategic situation. How, I mean, the head of China just went to Saudi Arabia. You know, they're just starting to build bridges between China and Saudi Arabia. China's ties with India have grown. Um, perhaps adding to, I mean, there's a little destabilization that's going on, at least in the AFPAC area, because of China's actions. China does border both Pakistan and Afghanistan. Of course, Iran borders both Afghanistan and, and Iraq. And Pakistan. Um, China actually landed one of the most recent um, oil contracts in Iraq. So China's been getting a little bit involved in Iraq, but it's not a direct presence. Iran's another story altogether. Um, the U.S. adopted, by invading Iraq, it adopted what used to be called a forward policy. Um, in doing so, you can get great benefits <coughs> if everything goes your way. If things don't go your way, you're highly vulnerable. And the country's neighboring a destabilized state can take advantage of that destabilization and undermine your presence. That's not too hard to do. It's quite clear that Iran has been very heavily involved in, in Iraq all along. It's been complicated by the fact that the U.S. has found itself in a very bizarre position of supporting in Iraq organizations that actually come out of Iran and are very close to Iran. The most notable of that is Skiri, which is one of the major Shia organizations. That's an organization that was established in Iraq. It was based in Iraq. It was armed by Iraq. And the U.S. actually um, relied on it in, in some of its stabilization efforts in 2003, 2004, 2005. And this has continued to this day. Um, this exact same groups that we rely on to try to stabilize Iraq politically are also very closely tied um, to Iran. And that will um, almost any scenario of the elections and who's going to be the next prime minister, almost all of them involve someone who's um, assumed to be extremely close to Iraq, I mean, to Iran, and probably to a great extent um, is going to line up their policies with the Iranian government.
I consider myself a very fortunate man because I've been shot at by six nationalities for sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Syrians, Saudi, Chechen, Afghan, Pakistani, and uh, Iranians, they, uh, they shipped 120 millimeter rockets. So we got 120 millimeter rocket fire from uh, Iranian made missiles. We would go to like the, the launch site, which is called the Poo site, which is really funny. We had to go find the Poo. And uh, you get to the Poo, and it says uh, made in Tehran, you know? So uh, that's that. But uh, the Pakistanis who shot at you, I take it they were not from. Oh, no. No, they were they with were Tochi the, scouts. They were with the Afghans. No, they were Pakistani military that shot at us because we got too close to their border because they were grumpy. Why'd you go close to their border? Well, we were right on their border. Their, uh, <laughs> their idea of... They are an allied country. <laughs> Roger that. Their idea of... Oh, uh, you see, I, I mean, I, I, I can joke with Sean, but you see what yeah. the problem is? Well, I mean, Pakistan considers it that it has made many, many sacrifices on behalf of the United States. And for many years, um, it goes back, you know, goes back to short, shortly after its independence. But the idea that American troops have actually crossed the line into, into Pakistan, the idea that also that American you know, military weapons have actually fired on Pakistan, aside from the Monica Lewinsky incident, but at other times as well, but especially now, I mean, these ongoing drone attacks in Fatah um, is really is really making so many Pakistanis consider that the U.S. is an occupying force in Afghanistan and is now bent on going over into Pakistan. And um, that is going to be fought quite vociferously. To answer your question, uh, the Pakistani border guard's version of border was very fluid, uh, ran about a click west of where they said, where the border is on the map. And then on top of that, uh, I think something that, that's kind of a broader point, um, Pakistan has trouble with ISI and their army supporting elements in Afghanistan. Uh, I'm a direct witness of this. We had uh, an OP, it's an observation point position, uh, which is basically a, a group of sandbags on a hill. And those things get attacked all the time. And in this particular instance, we had a uh, Pakistani checkpoint, which look like castles. They're really cool, like medieval straight up castles, pyramids, parapets, the whole business uh, across the way. And you can, you can see all the way. So uh, the insurgents come up and they attack us. It's nighttime. And we have a thermal viewer called an ITAS um, mm -hmm. that can see for kilometers. So we beat them. They're hauling their wounded back across the border into Pakistan, and they haul them straight to the border checkpoint, the Pakistani border checkpoint. The Pakistanis open their doors and let them in, and then they let them go the next day. We watch the whole thing happen. And it's just, there's so, there's such a complicated issue dealing with Pakistanis and. Well, and, and again, part of it is very deeply connected to that there's a lot of resentment against what the U.S. has been doing in Afghanistan and how it has overflown into Pakistan's borders with what had happened in Swat just roughly a year ago right now. Also, even if you look at Pakistan's own electoral history, in October of 2002, there were elections that were held um, in Pakistan. That was the last round of national elections before the 2008 elections. And what happened in the Northwest Frontier Province, which is the part that actually borders Afghanistan, is that you saw, um, for the first time in Pakistan's entire electoral history, an Islamist political power <coughs> party actually came, um, was invited to form the government. And that was the MMA, the Mutahid de Majlis Amal, which was a coalition of six Islamist political parties. This, this was unprecedented in Pakistan's history. It had never happened that the Islamic parties had won at the ballot box in elections. And a lot of people give, um, you know, look at the reasons behind that as the ongoing U.S. engagement in Afghanistan, angering people. Other questions? Some new person, new part of the room? No questions? We can. <laughs> I know, now there's like 10. <laughs> okay, I can go home. Okay, um, I'll try to make this pretty broad, because so, I know there's a lot of um, 
different elements to it. But um, anyone's free to answer it, really. Uh, how effective a fighting force is the Afghanistan National Army? And, um, well, I saw a documentary recently and it talked about on um, Al Jazeera and talked about um, how the Taliban got paid three times as much, three times more than the Afghan National Army. And how does that go into that? What do you mean the Taliban got paid? Like, um, Taliban soldiers got paid. Oh, it's Taliban soldiers. Yes, okay. yes. They're members of the Afghan National Army. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to answer that question by telling you a quick story. Uh, we get into contact, right? And the Afghan National Army roll around in Ford Rangers. Uh, like, they're, they're painted very nicely, but they're essentially Ford Rangers. And uh, we get in contact, RPGs going off, receiving tons of small arms fire, da 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 And I'm perched over the hood of, uh, of my Humvee, returning fire, and I look to my right to check to see if the, the Afghans return fire, because part of our job is to train the Afghans. And where are the Afghans? I have no idea. So we're like, all right, well, I got, I got a job to do. So uh, the shooting stops, all that's over. And I turn around to see where the Afghans are. There's a ditch uh, directly behind us that they're all taking cover in, holding their weapons, and not wanting to shoot back. And this uh, is where I want to do my voiceover. And why don't they want to shoot back? No argument. Uh, I, I would say uh, better leadership, better training, more confidence in the mm -hmm. government. But. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so what, that's the question, what government are we defending? A, a sure. government that even its own troops don't wish to defend. Sure. This is the, this is, you know, really getting to the kernel of the issue. So, uh, aside from building a greater Afghan respect for their government, which I think we have a possibility of doing here in the next five to ten years, um, they're kind of awful. And uh, part, of that, part of that is we need to do a better job of training. We had a whole bunch of resources go to Iraq for you know, almost a decade that, that should have been in Afghanistan. So now that we have more troops, uh, the guys that were directly responsible for training the Afghan army, there were two of them for 200 dudes. Now that we have more people on the ground there, hopefully that training program is going to get improved and they'll be able to do a better job. I mean, part of, part of building a professional army is having that confidence in the government and have people that want to be there and want to do their job. The other part is your leadership. Your NCOs, uh, non-commissioned officers who are enlisted men who've gotten into leadership positions. And when you have an Afghan National Army that isn't even seven years old, you don't have a lot of good NCOs. So uh, give them, you know, another five, ten years, I bet half of them will be in the ditch and the other half will still be <laughs> shooting. But th this goes back to your other question, though, about paying the Taliban. First of all, it's, it's, it's not very clear always who's Taliban and who's not Taliban, okay? The other thing that's also really not clear is, in, you know, we've, we have been fed this entire decade that, you know, Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, are these indistinguishable? Well, they are distinguishable. The Taliban were not Al-Qaeda. And that's an important distinction most Americans fail to make. Now, it's, it's a huge issue. Do you talk to the Taliban? Do you try to draw the Taliban into the government or not? Finally, they're trying to draw the Taliban, and, and I'm not convinced one way, I don't, you know, I mean, it, it's a tough situation. The reason why the t situation is so tough right now is that for the last nine years, these things have been percolating, and they've been getting worse. Well, going back to what you said about the Ford Rangers, um, they, Al Jazeera had interviewed a, like a unit of elite um, ANA troops. And one of their big complaints was that they didn't have um, the complex equipment and the armored vehicles that the coalition forces had. Well, so. I can kind of answer that. <laughs> um, they're not trained on it. Um, I mean, that point blank. I mean, you, you take one of our, you take the, the lowest private within the United States military, um, if he's been in after basic training and whatever military, an infantry soldier, he's going to be well-trained. 
he's going to be well trained on a number of weapon systems. More than likely, he's going to have drivers training to drive that Humvee. Um, he's probably going to have a number of training on different optics, whether it is a uh, a 68, which is a close quarters combat, which is a little red dot if you've played Modern Warfare 2. <laughs> um, and, hey, that's how we can relate to it, okay? It's the little red dot on Modern Warfare 2. ACOGs, Modern Warfare 2, they're going to be trained on ACOGs. They're going to know how to fire an M2, um, an M203. They're going to know how to fire a, a, a 240 Bravo, which is a machine gun. They're going to know how to fire a 249 squad automatic weapon. And that's just the stuff that they're going to learn in their unit. That's not specialty training, such as being able to fly a predator drone, things like that. So they're not trained on it yet. And it takes months and years at times to be trained to the proficiency as one of our lower enlisted soldiers are. And not only that, it's not your equipment that wins your war. Right. It's your war fighters. Right. And, you know, uh, if those are elite ANA, that's great for them. Maybe they're capable of, of handling some of that stuff. I personally, uh, with night vision goggles, I fell on my face every two steps. <laughs> yeah. I'm awful with night vision goggles. Uh, but it's your people that win your fight. Mm -hmm. It's not your weapon. It's not your Ford Ranger versus your Humvee. It's the guys you got and how motivated they are to do the job. Mm -hmm. If you had a motivated company of ANA out there with bolt-action rifles against a company of Taliban, properly motivated, properly led, they could win that fight. Right. So, uh, to me, that, that I mean, not criticizing you, that's a poor argument for them to make and a poor excuse for them not being able to do their except, job. Except there's one other thing that there's a last factor there, and that is that we know that there have been a lot of people that we've mentioned already in the Afghan army who just leave, right? And so one of the big concerns that's also been raised is you, you train people in the Afghan army to use all this equipment, and then they leave and they take it over to whoever the enemy is, who I'm not sure who it is, but I guess you might say the Taliban, but they're not, they're just anybody who's not supporting Karzai, I guess, is the yeah. enemy. The, who the enemy is, is, is as Anita has brought up a couple times, is a huge question, and, and that book I recommended to that gentleman, Accidental Guerrilla, is all about that subject and who the enemy is that we're fighting in Afghanistan right now. Highly recommend. And, but the problem is if we're in the midst of a, of a military war in Afghanistan and we have not identified the enemy, I think we need to spend a little time doing that. Um, Al Jazeera was mentioned in the previous question, and on the note of media, Dr. Weiss, you, you clearly aren't happy with the U.S.'s media. I was just wondering if you could name a few sources that you thought were unbiased and would really be more informative of what's going on in Afghanistan. Okay. I can, I can name a few media sources. I cannot say they're not biased, um, because every, all media sources have their own biases. I think that I've had a lot of firsthand um, engagement with American media in Pakistan, okay? And, um, and it amazes me how, how, it, how critical it is to get the story out quickly without necessarily getting the story right. What I try to do and what I say in all my classes is just try to read as best as you can a cross-section of media from as many different kinds of countries as possible. So read the New Straits Times out of Malaysia. Read Dawn or, um, out of Pakistan, just D-A-W-N, very good source of media. Do I think it's not biased? It absolutely is. But it's going to give you a different bias. Frontier Post is a great newspaper out of Peshawar. And what's really interesting with the Frontier Post is that it gives lots of different biases all the time, because they don't know whose side that they're on. Um, but Al Jazeera, I think, in the past couple of years, has really tried, at least Al Jazeera coming, coming out of Doha. Um, you know, there is Al Jazeera that's broadcasting out of <coughs> DC and, and elsewhere. But I think that they're at least trying to to convey um, a cross-section of different opinions. And there's a number of other Arab uh, news stations that are doing that. If anybody really wants a list, I do actually have a list in my office. You can send me an email and I'll, and I'll send it back of, of just a cross-section. Do I think they're unbiased? No. But I think it's like triangulation. You know, as, as many different perspectives as you can read, you can try to, try to get a better sense of what's really going on. I have a question about the uh, training of these uh, Afghan soldiers. 
Um, back in the 80s, when the Soviets invaded, um, Reagan, the Reagan administration sent in a lot of American-made weaponry and essentially trained from afar the Afghans that were there uh, to fight against the Soviets. So later on, 20, 30 years later, we're dealing with American weapons being fired upon us from, the, from um, on, on us now. And they have the, the advantage with the terrain. They understand the terrain. They know how to fire on us. And this is, I think, mostly addressed through Sean here. But how do we tr properly train them and properly give them the weapons, but be assured that later on, if there are conflicts in the future, how are we knowing that they're not going to turn back on us? Because, I mean, if you train your enemy, enemy as, with your own tactics, what are you, what are, what's your advantage then on their, on their turf? Well, all we're teaching them how to do is be a, a standing army. You know, we're not, we're not handing them over nukes. We're, we're not giving them Apaches, you know what I mean? We're, we're not giving them any capability that's, you know, above and beyond anything uh, normal. Now, uh, that being said, some of what uh, Chris Weiss and I talk about from time to time is, you know, what we're doing in Afghanistan, why we're there, da 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 um, If all goes according to plan-ish, uh, we have no need to fight Afghan. Like, well, they may not necessarily be an ally, but they're not going to be an enemy. And if we don't have a pipeline, if we don't have any resources there, there, there's no need for us to fight them in the future. So I'm not terribly concerned. I would, wh where did you hear about uh, American weapons being turned on Americans? Just curiosity. I'm not trying to argue. No, that. the it's the ones that came in the early '80s. Right. Even so. Right. The so. Well, I know that they were. Yeah, but they were. It was mostly Russian yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There were. It was stingers, Russian but, things, and it was also right. things that the U.S. paid for that was made elsewhere in the Middle East, right. brought to Afghanistan, looking like Russian weapons, so that when the when the Afghans were using it, they would be um, pumped up to think that they had gotten that from Russians, but it was actually things that the U.S. had actually been involved in manufacturing. The best way to, just to answer, the best way to ensure, though, that these weapons are not used against you is to win the hearts and minds of people, is to make people feel that you're deep, that, that you're truly engaged in trying to help them and their future generations, you know, community, this is what, international studies, we teach about development, you know, community development activities, political development, economic development, to try to create a more prosperous environment and then people will say there's, there's something viable that we're getting out of having you here to begin with, rather than why are you here just using up our resources and shooting at us. I'm quick, I'm sorry. I just want to make a quick comment, um, just kind of feedback what Sean said. We're not teaching them tactics. The first thing that soldiers need to learn is discipline, um, and that is what you're trying to teach them. So when bullets start flying, they're not cowering in a ditch, holding on to their weapon, that they're actually out fighting. That's the first thing. And there's so many tactics that we use that to try to teach them all of them, it, it would never happen. Yeah. One more question, if that's OK. In your honest opinion, do we see a good future in Afghanistan or Iraq without all the, you know, being hopeful, without being, being completely realistic? Will it ever be good? Because it hasn't been in the past. I think Afghan's tough because, you know, they've got a lot of challenges. They have natural resource issues. They have the <laughs> infrastructure. infrastructure issues, just the complete demolition of any kind of infrastructure over the last 30 years. Um, th that's a tough road to hope. Um, but I think that if you look back at Afghan uh, under pre-1979, they were doing pretty well for themselves. So I think if you can get a good period of prosperity, get some good economic you know, base under them, they'll be fine. Uh, or at least fine for the region, fine-ish. But, but now I will introduce another, another point, though. And that is it's not just about Afghanistan. Can Afghanistan do pretty well? You have to recognize that the reality is that, that what happens in Afghanistan has, has very critical implications for Pakistan. Pakistan itself, for the last three years, has been held hostage to militarism, to suicide bombings, things that are totally unprecedented in Pakistan's history. Let's not forget also, as you said, we're not training Afghans to use nuclear weapons. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. And it's becoming a little bit different. I mean, 10 years ago, 
if you ask me, as many people did, what, you know, are Pakistan's nuclear weapons secure 10 years ago, I would have said absolutely. I mean, there is no, you know, the military in Afghanistan is, is both loyal and it's very well trained and, you know, I mean, there's, there was, would be no question. Today, I'm not sure that I would be as emphatic. There's a lot of different things that are going on. As mentioned before, I mean, there's, there's, little, there's little groups within the Pakistan military that are not necessarily convinced that the way that the federal government is going is the best way. Most people are convinced that the way the federal government is going is not the best way, but for different reasons. Um, and so I think that it, it's less of what do we see in the future for Afghanistan, because like, I, I think that once the United States really hunkers down and tries to, I don't even like to use the word rebuild, or, you know, because there was not much there to begin with, but building Afghanistan, rebuilding Afghanistan, that's fine. But the real challenge down the road now is Pakistan. And the many, and the hundreds of, you know, the, the millions of people who are resentful of what has happened to Pakistan because of U.S. involvement in Afghanistan. In Iraq, I would say that um, compared to Afghanistan, Iraq looks positively rosy. <laughs> Even as there are very serious problems um, that still face the Iraqis, but it does have a lot of things you're saying that's missing in Afghanistan. It has an infrastructure, even if it needs rebuilding. It has assets. It's got big oil revenues. It's got a state that is at least semi-functional. It's got an educated population and tradition of an educated population, um, universities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, the future of Iraq um, is going to probably rest on a series of whether there's a viable political compromise in the future. Um, a political compromise between Shia and Sunni over what their respective roles are going to be in the Afghan, I mean, in the Iraqi government. Some sort of compromise with respect to oil revenues, which hasn't yet been determined yet, and some sort of compromise with Kurdistan. Um, there's not even an agreement on exactly where the Kurdish, Kurdish borders are, let alone anything else. And all of that stuff awaits for the next government. All of those issues remain outstanding. There are people in the US Army, I said there, Tom Ricks, another big figure has actually written um, wrote an early book, I don't know if you guys have read this one, uh, Fiasco, uh, calling for counterinsurgency co uh, methods in Iraq, and then wrote an account of the surge that centers on that. Ricks wrote a recent article in which he um, has a concluding piece, it was op-ed in the New York Times, in which he says, um, there are those in the US Army who argue that we should just pull out now on the grounds that there's going to be a civil war anyway, so we might as well just get out of the way. Um, and he says, well, the opposing argument is there's no particular reason to gamble on that eventuality. I think we have time for one final question. OK, so going off of that, um, do you see in the near future us actually getting out of Iraq? Because I know there's been a lot of talk about it, but whether it'll actually happen anytime soon is hard for like the lay person to understand. And then also, Considering when we do, what will our relationship be with Iraq? Well, the first question, Obama's um, stated policy is pull out by August um, and leaving behind a very, very small advisory force. Um, I'm going to venture out on a general prediction. I, I think they're going to reverse course. And the reason why I think they're going to reverse course is that they're not going to want to take the risk of um, a pull out leading to the possibility of civil war. As I very seriously doubt that there's going to be an immediate resolution to all these political issues in Iraq that is in the next few months. It's probably going to take a couple of months even to put together a government. Last time there was a national election, it took five months just to identify the prime minister. That means uh, between now and, say, early summer, we might not have a working government in, um, in Iraq. Most of the people on the ground think it's going to take about two months. That is what, that's what Iraqis are saying who are involved in this. Um, it depends on what the outcome of the election is. So my guess is there's probably going to be some sort of postponement. Um, as for the second issue, this has been a long complaint of many Iraqis. They have no idea what U.S. intentions are with respect to Iraq in the long run. 
Uh, frankly, I'm not sure what they are. Um, the Obama administration, I, the Bush administration never made it very clear that they, they sent out all sorts of mixed signals, in whether in terms of their public statements or in terms of behaviors, um, and often contradictory. They seem to be saying one thing and doing something else. The Obama administration simply hasn't addressed it, as far as I can tell. So it's, I think it's pretty hazardous to, to, to guess exactly what U.S. intentions are for the long run in Iraq. I, th I think because we don't know what, I mean, well, I think that's true. whether we're talking about Iraq or Afghanistan, I mean, I don't think that there is a sense of these are U.S. intentions. I think that there's, part of it is, is a great thing about democracy, that you have a lot of different um, stances. But the other problem is, is that it's so unclear. Yeah. And it gives very mixed signals to people. So Afghans are just, you know, I mean, I was just in SWAT a couple of weeks ago in Pakistan. And the, the Taliban had taken over this beautiful valley. And now people, you know, the, the, finally the Pakistan military went in. You know, there was such widespread support to get rid of, the, of these extremists all over the country, not only in that area, but throughout the country. So they went in. They started bombing them. You had, you know, millions of people become IDPs overnight. Um, internally displaced persons overnight. And now people have gone back. Life has, has settled down a little bit like it used to be, except peop, there's this unease because people don't know who's Taliban. I was, standing there by, I was standing there by a woman's house, and she said, look at this truck going by. And there must have been like 30 men you know, on the top of the truck as it was traveling. She said, two thirds of those men are Taliban. They're not saying it now, and they're not, you know, they've cut off their beards, maybe, or, you know, or, you know, they're acting differently. But we know the fear is still there, that these people can still come back, and they can get the same kind of control that they had in the past. And so it's one thing when you're thinking about SWAT, where there's, you know, a Pakistani government of Pakistan infrastructure. But when you go to the when you go to FATA, or you go over to Afghanistan, where that infrastructure itself is lacking, there's no political legitimacy of any state other than your own clan. You know the Khans. It's very problematic to think where this is going to go in the future. Um, with Iraq, I think that uh, one thing that you <laughs> got to keep in mind when they say on the media or what the government says is that they say no combat troops, they don't ever say that we're leaving, ever. Um, and I think we're going to be there for a while, um, uh, helping hopefully rebuild the infrastructure, but also, as, uh, as it been pointed out, that we have no idea <laughs> what we're over there for. Uh, what, are, what is our plan? What, what, are we, what are we supposed to be doing? Um, and that's what I, it kind of goes back to my original statement of, we can't get political over there. Okay. Now, as for um, I think, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. The second one. Um, that was actually it. the yeah, second one was, was oh. the um, long-term strategic. Okay. What was the first interest? One? Um, do you see us getting out? In no. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see us ever leaving Iraq for for a while. There's just too many questions that um, I was there for the first election. Um, it was a it was a great time. It was a big party, but um, outside of that. I really don't know what the direction is, so I think we're going to be there for a while. Well, I think we've reached the end of our time. Please uh, join me again in thanking our panelists. I just want to remind you all that at Lane Community College on Friday evening, there's going to be the Lane Peace Symposium. Um, I am one of the speakers. I'm going to talk about um, mili confronting militarism in Pakistan and why it matters to us. But uh, Tom Hayden's going to be there, and some other, you know, there's a lot of other speakers who are involved. And it should be quite interesting. So I thought I'd just bring that to your attention. It's at 7 o'clock on Friday night at LCC.